welcome to the Jet Setter Show, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. Enjoy and learn from a variety of experts on topics ranging from upscale travel at wholesale prices to retiring overseas, to global real estate and business opportunities, to tax havens and expatriate opportunities. You'll get great ideas on unique cultures, causes, and cruise vacations. Whether you're wealthy or just want to live a wealthy lifestyle, The Jet Setter Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to The Jet Setter Show. This is Jason Hartman, your host, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. I think you'll enjoy the interview we have for you today, and we will be back with that in less than 60 seconds here on The Jet Setter Show. Hey, it's my pleasure to welcome Tim Ringy Sailor to the show, and he is on the show Diggers. It's a National Geographic show. He's an explorer and historian for the National Geographic series, and I think we're going to learn some fantastic stuff. He he digs up all kinds of crazy things, including atomic bombs. So uh, let's talk to him a little bit about that. Tim, welcome. How are you? Great. It's great to be here. How are you? Yeah, it's good to have you. So you, you live in Montana, I believe. Is that correct? That is correct. And, yep. uh, and you're coming to us today, though, from Maryland, right? Right, right. I'm in Maryland right now. We're still making shows out here, and we're we're doing really good. Fantastic. Well, well. Before we ask you about specific episodes, tell us a little bit about the series in general. Well, Diggers is just kind of a thing that developed out of uh, the. It's not just me. It's KG, the other guy on the show. We met in Montana and started treasure hunting over the years and making our own DVDs, and then it just kind of exploded into this television show in combination with National Geographic, and it's been a great thing, not just for us, because we get to do what we love to do, but we get to go to all these you know, historically significant sites now that are normally off limits to most people, and, and we get to dig things with an archaeological team and mark it all out, and we get to discover all kinds of interesting and weird things that most people never get a chance to do. Sure, yeah, very interesting. Now, it's so it's not limited then to metal detecting, right? That's just one of the tools in your arsenal. Would that be a, a correct? It, it is correct. I mean, we, we use sifters and other things as well, but our main tool is metal detecting. That's generally what we use. And then, for example, like there was one... Uh, archaeological site that was about to be destroyed and all covered up because they're building a new highway and bridge in there. And they were just trying to get everything out of this old fort from the 1700s that they could. And they were going and they were running out of time and they gave us a call. And we went out there and found literally hundreds of things. And it it worked out as a win-win situation for everybody because now they're museum gets to have these things that were probably going to be lost in the long run had they not. Well, so, so when you say they, who, who is they in this particular case? And... Oh, well, there's a, I, I don't know if it was a, a private or state, probably hired by the state because when they're building highways and stuff, a lot of times they'll have to do mandatory digs to make sure that they're not going to ruin anything or cover, say, an Indian burial ground or some something that might be there that we're unaware of. So so it's a governmental agency in this case, like the Highway yeah. Safety Commission or, you know, whoever decides where highways are built and how they're built, I assume, right? Exactly. And every once in a while, obviously, I mean, it's, you know, there's nothing, there's, there's so much stuff out there that eventually, you know, they're going to conflict and, and, you know, it's just, it's fairly common actually, but it's, it's just nice that they'll allow them a little time to try to dig some stuff up to save it because, over 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 time, a lot of the things made out of iron or even copper or brass can pit and eventually rot away. So it's nice to be able to save some of that stuff before it's too late. I'm sure, before it's uh, kind of buried or entombed forever, right? Yeah, or before it actually disintegrates and disappears forever anyway. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, I've always wondered how powerful a tool, Tim, is a metal detector. How How deep, how much ground can it penetrate? 
Well, there's so many different kinds, but when you think of like the guy on the beach walking along looking for rings and stuff, the ones like that, like the ones that we use, generally they'll go a couple feet underground if you've got some gigantic target. But if you're looking for something as small as a ring or a dime, you're generally looking about eight inches and usually more like four to five. Wow, that, that's not much. So uh, what, what kind of equipment do you use? Well, we, we actually run something called an AT Gold. It's just kind of an all-purpose machine. It's waterproof. You know, you can drop it in the water and, and wade in the surf with it, and it works on land, and it's, it's really lightweight. So we, we tend to use that. It was actually designed to find gold, tiny bits of gold, but we use it because it works so well on other things as well. So. And, and, and so, I mean, if people want to do stuff like this recreationally, like you mentioned, you know, the guy on the beach and so forth, what should they look at spending? I mean, what, what kind of equipment do they need? I, I have a friend who's into metal detecting, and I, I kind of tease him about it. It's like, what a funny sport, you know? <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> you know, yeah. but uh, but people are still into it. You know, and I would also think that a lot of the things that you can do, like the guy on the beach example that you mentioned. But my friend, he goes on trips and flies to places just to do metal detecting. Like it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big deal. And you know, I, I've always wondered, uh, isn't it sort of picked over? Aren't I mean, the world's been pretty explored, hasn't it? That's the thing. Every day on a beach, there are thousands of people out there losing stuff. Every single day something is lost, so it's constantly being replenished. And the other thing is, you know, there'll be yards or places that we go, and 99 out of 100 of them have already been hit multiple times by people. But, you know, technology keeps getting better, and the depth on them and the accuracy gets better and better. And the crazy thing is, is we've hunted places say, in Montana before this show ever aired, you know, 20 and 30 times we'd hunt them because you can walk at one angle and a slightly different angle and not hear something. And you can hear it going back over it in a different pattern. So you, it's almost impossible. Well, it is impossible to get everything. If you go into a, a place, you, you can never get it all. We always say that. And so you shouldn't get discouraged in that respect. And to answer your main question... You really don't have to spend a whole lot of money to get a detector to find something uh, on the beach. You can spend even a couple hundred dollars, you know, two or three hundred dollars, and you get a pretty decent machine. And it will find things, and it will discriminate things out, so you don't have to listen to nails, for example, you know, iron, and you can just listen only for silver or copper or whatever you want to hear. So, so they make different sounds, the different metals. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. The funny thing is. You know, this is kind of ironic, but the, you know, a, a gold coin, like a little dollar gold coin, sounds very similar to a nickel, which also sounds similar to a lot of different beer pull tabs. So, <laughs> you know, you have to dig thousands and thousands of beer tabs before you ever come across the a, a good gold coin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, tell us about some of the, the interesting finds. Certainly we want to hear about the atomic bomb. <laughs> but, uh, okay. but, you know, okay. other stuff too. Well, we found, I mean, really most of the stuff we find is not really, you know, like a, a gold coin. I, I've hunted, you know, almost my whole life and I've only found one gold coin. And so you, you can't go out thinking you're going to get rich doing it. You, you got to go out with the, just the thrill of the hunt, you know, in the back of your mind and enjoy what you're doing and, and be happy. If you find a mercury dime worth $3, I'm thrilled with that because it's, it's cool, it's old, and it's very different than buying one for $3 in the store. To find one, it, it makes it almost priceless. Well, you know, it's, it's like fishing, you know, you, you get to tell a story. <laughs> yeah, That's what makes exactly. it interesting. Yeah. That is exactly what it is. It's dirt fishing. People refer to it as that. So, exact same thing. So, so interesting finds. I don't mean to interrupt you from that. Oh, yeah, I mean, sorry. I'm sure you've had so yeah. many of them. <laughs> uh, yeah, there. I, I mean, we found. I mean, we have found our share of rings. I've found solid gold diamond rings before, and so was KG. But probably my most interesting find is really not worth much, but it's just incredible. It's a. It was an 1894 political pin made of copper that's an anaconda, the capital of Montana. 
1894, they had a big battle over where they were going to put the capital, and Helena won. So this pin was actually untrue. It was just printed up in anticipation of their victory or advertising for it. But I just think it's kind of neat because it never really was the capital. Hmm, yeah, very interesting. And and so in terms of jewelry and things like that, you know, what are some of the most valuable things? How, how much have things been worth? I mean, you know, what I'm getting at is people that might be listening that want to do this is, you know, not just a hobby, right. but can they make an income from it? <laughs> yeah. You know, people ask me that all the time, and it would be great and romantic to say, yeah. I'm a treasure I, hunter I'm for a living. Make my living yeah. as a treasure hunter, like a pirate or whatever. But it's just not true. I mean, most of the stuff we dig up is historically valuable, but monetarily, it's really not. I mean, some of these, like, casings and stuff, I mean, maybe if you get some rare thing, it might be worth five or ten bucks, but most of them are just basically worth the brass they're made of. But on, on the other hand, people do get lucky, and especially in beaches and places like that where people are putting sunscreen on and rings slip off their fingers. You know, we've found rings worth, you know, well over $1,000 a piece. So, I mean, it can happen, but I just wouldn't expect that to happen every day. Sure, sure. Do you, do, what do you do with the stuff you find? I mean, do you, do you just have a huge garage with, with all your stuff in it in Montana? <laughs> or, or do you sell this stuff? Or uh, what do you do with it? No, we, I, I, both of us have occasionally, I'd say you could count it on one hand, the times we traded or sold something to a collector that just wanted it, you know. But to me, the stuff I find is becomes kind of personal. And I, I've kept everything, you know, too much, obviously, because most of it is junk. But I keep the stuff. But when we have our show and we're hunting in a place that actually has some kind of historical significance, we actually have archaeologists and people from local museums and historians there, and they take the stuff and put it all in museums. For example, the Hatfield-McCoy episode we did, all the bullets and stuff we found on that hillside, they're pretty historically significant, so all that stuff was put directly in a museum so everybody can enjoy it. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, more on interesting finds. I mean, tell us how you found a nuclear bomb. (laughs) <laughs> you know, let's talk yeah, about well, we big stuff. <laughs> yeah, now that stuff, I mean, they always send us on these wild goose chases after a, you know, a lost stash of gold or whatever, and the show always becomes about the weird stuff that we find on the way, the unexpected stuff. But every once in a while, it does happen where we find what we're told to go find. And in this case, it's, you know, I hate to be a spoiler, but, you know, it's obviously the main crux of the show, and we did a excellent job of finding what we were sent after so it it gets crazy and you know anybody that knows kg and i knows we'll have a complete mental breakdown when we find anything good so mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it, it gets it gets wild and the the cool thing is is that this happened it blew that giant crater in the earth and it's still there the crater but fragments and junk had to be thrown for probably over a mile when that hit because it was such a huge impact yeah. Well, so uh, I, I, oh, so you were you were sent to find this this bomb, and how how did you find it with metal detectors? With metal detectors, we were in plowed farm fields, and the owners had you know gave us the keys to the gate, and we went through, and we just started looking, and we found stuff that you would normally expect to find in farm fields, like little chunks of plow blades and you know sickle teeth and things that you know are pretty common in those areas. And, but we, we were listening for, we knew this bomb was made out of that aircraft aluminum stuff. So we were listening for something that would sound like maybe a silver dollar or something that was, had a real high pitch to it. And, you know, we're out there for, I don't know how long we were out there. Not as long as you would think, though. Usually it takes forever to find something that sounds good. And all of a sudden, my detector exploded. I mean, it just lit up and I just kind of, I didn't even believe the number that I was seeing, and I just thought, well, that can't be. And I dug the hole, and I'm just staring at this object, and I'm thinking, I might have found the bomb. <laughs> wow. Wild. How, 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 how large was it, and how, 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 how did you dig it up? I mean, were you worried digging it up? <laughs> you must have been, right? Uh, not, not really. I mean, they had a piece of it that they showed us that they had found like 20 or 30 years ago, and they took it to a university and had it analyzed, and there were residual bits of radiation still coming off of it. So 
um, they knew it was a piece of the bomb. And so I just, we both knew in advance exactly what to listen for and what to look for. So, I mean, obviously when it exploded, the thing was shattered and the metal was twisted and melted and burned. And, and so we just looked for anything that had that exact same sound and look to it. And there were chunks of it everywhere. It was awesome. Amazing. Yeah, it's just just amazing. Incredible. Well, is any other interesting finds that you want to tell us about? Uh, well, we did. We did have. A, now, that show, um, that airs August 7th, which is tomorrow, Wednesday. And that Atomic Bomb one and the Billy the Kid, those are back-to-back on the premiere night on National Geographic. But we have another upcoming episode. I think it's the very next week, and it's about Bonnie and Clyde. And that was one of those crazy shootouts they had after they were the posse caught up with them in Iowa. And we found some really interesting evidence of where some of the shooting may have taken place compared to what the historical records show currently. So that's going to be a really interesting show. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you, you probably can't tell us too much about that, right? <laughs> I don't want to give you the whole thing away, yeah, but you sure. know, as usual, you know, I'm always, we always have to play like, you know, George is Billy the Kid, and I have to be the one that gets shot in all the episodes or whatever. And, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, of course, this one, I had to play Bonnie. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a good show. These, these This year, are, I mean, not only are the historical, all the stories woven through them, and it's really rich in history, but they've got some incredible graphics, and the show's really turned out cool this year. Yeah, good stuff. Well, now, how many episodes have you done so far? Well, the first season, I think we had 20, and the second season, we're going to have almost 30. So by the end of this year, we should have close to 50 episodes of the show done. And that means we've got a lot of holes to dig, because what people don't realize is that to make a 22-minute show, we have to film all week, and, you know, people are seeing a few things we find, the great things, but they don't see the thousand holes we dug before we right. hit that coin, you know, that had a nail in it or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Do you, do you encounter any opposition? You know, I would think that there would be, like, environmental groups out there that are opposed to what, you, what you're what you doing and, you know, say, don't don't dig all these holes and, and disturb some little bug <laughs> or something. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. There's... You know, just with like anything you do, you know, there's, you know, there's good doctors, bad doctors, good lawyers, bad lawyers. There's always going to be people, you know, that are are complaining and worried about something that we're doing. But the number one thing to remember is just obey the laws, get permission to go do what you're doing, and you'll be fine. It's just when we go into, you know, it's one thing if you're hunting your backyard and it's all fun and nobody cares, you know, you find a couple of coins and everybody's happy. But when we go into some of these more historical places, places with historical significance, that's why we have our archaeological team, you know, and all the historians to advise us because we don't want to end up disturbing something that we shouldn't disturb. You know, we want to be a a help rather than a hindrance. And it's been very, very successful so far. But uh, so far we haven't had anybody call about the bugs or anything that we're disturbing. Sure, sure, yeah. Well, give out the website if you would and tell people where they can learn more about the show. Okay, yeah, we've got, I mean, just the National Geographic. All you have to do is go to the National Geographic website at natgeo.com and it will, you just type in diggers and it'll pop up the whole TV schedule. Or you can go to anacondatreasure.com and there's a direct link right to our page there too. Fantastic. T- tell us, uh, just before you go, a little bit about your travel background. H- how many countries have you been to, and and what happens when you do this offshore? Oh, well, actually, we've done all of this stuff within the United States so far. And next season, they're talking about sending us over to Europe, and, and I so I'm sure we'll cross those bridges when we come to them. Yeah, I would almost think that be there'd be more stuff to find. You know, certainly Europe is more compact and there's so much history there, obviously, that you might find more things. <laughs> exactly. There's, there's, it's a denser population and a longer time of population. So we've actually had invites from all kinds of places over there wanting us to come over and help identify places and just 
I'm really looking forward to it. I'd love to head over there. Yeah, fantastic. Good. So have you, have you done a lot of travel uh, offshore, or is it mostly in the U.S.? Uh, mostly in the U.S. for the show. I've been, I actually went to school for a little while in Vienna, and I would love to, any chance I could get to head over to Germany or Austria and do a little hunt, and that would be fun. That's where my family comes from originally. Yeah, fu- you know. Funny you mentioned that. I was in Vienna two weeks ago. I, I love that. It's a beautiful city. Really? So you, you did you get to go see the ring and all that? No, not this time. But I was uh, I was there before, and it's always been one of my favorite European cities. I was on a pretty whirlwind tour. Went to a lot of countries this time, and and so I was uh, I was I was going uh, fairly quick. But but it was good. Good trip. Beautiful city. I love it. Awesome. I, I, when you guys get over to Europe, I think that's going to be really exciting because I, I just have a feeling the discoveries will be more frequent and possibly more amazing. <laughs> I don't know if yeah, you get any more amazing yeah. than a nuclear bomb, though. But <laughs> Well, it is. And just the fact that you mentioned that, it's odd. Just two days ago, I got an email from Germany, and the guy said, I love your show. It's really interesting to see how you get so crazy over a find from the... 18th or 19th century, because to us, that's brand new. <laughs> yeah, you're right. That's like new stuff for them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, if, you, if you want something historical, it's got to be at least a thousand year old, uh, years old in Europe, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. It has to be a bejeweled sword handle from the Middle Ages. There you go, exactly. Well, hey, Tim, this has been very interesting talking to you. Keep up the good work on the show, and thanks for sharing some of these insights with us today. All right. Well, thanks for having me. It's been great. What's great about the shows you'll find on jasonhartman.com is that if you want to learn how to finance your next big real estate deal, there's a show for that. If you want to learn more about food storage and the best way to keep those onions from smelling up everything else, there's a show for that. If you honestly want to know more about business ethics, there's a show for that. And if you just want to get away from it all and need to know something about world travel, there's even a show for that. Yep, there's a show for just about anything. Only from jasonhartman.com or type in Jason Hartman in the iTunes store. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc. exclusively.